So this is Adam on the Global Onslaught here. And I've got a bit of a hushed tone this evening, I guess, because I'm nice, relaxed and chilled. And I'm talking to the one, the only, Janet Robin. How are you doing, cool. Janet? I'm doing great. I'm glad I'm glad you're nice and chill. I'm nice and chill, too. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way it has to be, these things. It's, it's the, it yeah. is the nature of things to be that way. Yes. And so it should be. Yeah. You've been on what I would probably say a mon- monumentous touring schedule, a arduous and I would even stretch to say grueling tour schedule. <laughs> Look yes. at the list. You've been everywhere, Janet. When do you find time to rest? Yeah, I don't know. Right now. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, yeah, I need to, uh, I need to work. I'm a little bit of a workaholic, but I've found that um, I do also need to take some breaks. And as a matter of fact, at the end of this tour, I'm, I'm going to Portugal for a week. So. Oh, very nice. And then just a bit of R and R is that? I, I am allowing myself that. Yeah. And are you banning yourself from the guitar for that week or is it? Well, you know, that's a good question because now I've started looking into maybe doing a gig in Portugal, you know, <laughs> like, while I'm there, you know, I will have all my equipment with me. So it, it's, what can I say? You know, I'm a, a bit addicted to playing. So I think to, to be, to be fair, looking back on your long, I must say long career yeah. uh, to date that you, that, that it seems to be to me anyway, that you, you constantly work. There is no let up. There is, I mean, not knowing you personally, but mm-hmm. reading your background and, and, and looking into your story, you, you're a woman who just doesn't stop for a minute. Would that be a, a fair assumption? I think so. I mean, yes, it's true. I'm getting a little older, so it's getting a little harder to keep up that schedule I kept up maybe 10 years ago or whatever. But, you know, I, I have always continued to keep working as much as possible. And I think it's the nature of the music business anyway. I mean, if you take too much time off, you just kind of lose that momentum, you know. And um, I do think, yes, it's healthy to take some time off, but you have to just balance it a bit. And, and uh, I think... Still, though, because it's it's the the music business is always changing and there's always new styles of music and people are always going on the road and releasing. Th- you kind of have to, like, you know, get into that that race a little bit, too. And you don't want to stop too much. You know, otherwise you kind of lose, like I said, lose that momentum. Maybe it's just a fear that I have or maybe I'm just a crazy, uh, anxious workaholic. The, <laughs> the last part is probably most true. <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably true but look, yeah. you know i mean like i said looking back i mean you you've kind of been permanently working since the age of 16 yeah yeah i got in precious metal yeah around that age uh, in high school and and um yeah i i honestly didn't know that i was going to be a professional musician for the for the rest of my life it, i just it just happened, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you start. I mean, you, 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 you had probably for a guitarist, probably one of the best starts in life, being taught by the by the uh, never to be forgotten Mr. Randy Rhodes. So, how, how did how did that come to be? I mean, it was obviously there was to do. With his family had a, a guitar store, store. Is that right? Yeah, his mother owned a, actually a music school, and it was very um, close to my parents' house where we lived in in North Hollywood in California and we got a referral to him because my brother actually was studying guitar and he wanted to take electric guitar Mm -hmm. and we were both at the time studying acoustic guitar so he wanted to take electric um so he went and moved over there and my parents still enrolled me in with another acoustic guitar teacher but that didn't last long because I whined and yelled and begged for an electric guitar so that I could also take electric guitar (laughs) and Randy was the teacher you know he was he was quite young at the time and he was in uh you know not as well world famous known Quiet Riot as they are now but Quiet Riot at the time was was a big LA band Mm -hmm. um so he was in that band and would do the gigs at night. And during the day, he was teaching at his mom's school. And that's, you know, that's that's the whole story of it. There's no any any uh, sexy story behind it. You know, it's just a plain old fashioned, you know, his uh, his his mom owned the, the music school. It was around the corner from my parents. And we just started taking lessons from him. And the lessons were 30 minutes. And I think they were initially eight dollars and uh, eight dollars for the thirty minutes. My goodness, he weren't cheap then at the time, <laughs> <laughs> and rightly so. Let's say that. But yeah. obviously, that must have stirred the fire in your belly to to sort of perform. It did. I mean, I you know I was already into guitar even just from the acoustic guitar playing. Um, 
and finger picking and things that I was learning. I was, nobody ever was telling me to practice. I just got a little obsessed with it on, and I, I was good at it. So I was, I was really desperately trying to find something I was good at. You know, I, I, I was like, okay at sports and this and that. Um, you know, I tried to do a, a lot of things that my brothers did, you know, karate and stuff like, that. but nothing seemed to fit until I picked up the guitar and I don't know why, but it just felt like a third arm, you know, for me, I just got obsessed with it. And then of course, when I started taking from Randy, I had never, ever seen anybody play like that before, you know, um, even, you know, Jimmy Page and Hendrix and all the people that I, you know, worshipped and listened to, I, he was sitting in front of me playing like, what, you know, this is crazy, you know, and uh, so crazy that I would actually bring, you know, friends to the lessons. You got to come see my guitar teacher, you know, um, he was uh absolutely incredible there's no he doubt was it. and he was incredible in 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 the lessons too and and he, and he was an incredible teacher i mean it wasn't like he just sat there and played for the 30 minutes but he was very focused teacher and and then of course when he would show you some of the things that you know he wanted you to learn you know special licks or different techniques you know he would do it very effortless and just you'd be like oh my god i really want to do that you know and mm -hmm. so yeah he was a huge inspiration to me he, ins he instilled a lot of confidence in a, in a young girl that was surrounded by you know two older brothers and i was just kind of a loner you know and um he had no like he was gender blind and age blind i i believe i was mainly the only girl student i think he had one other girl student that didn't last very long, but I was like his main only female student and also the youngest student that he had. And he could really care less. I mean, he just, he was just like, you want to play, you want to learn, let's do it. You know? And do you, and do you apply any of that? I, I teach to the exactly way teach the same it? way. Yes. I teach the same way to my students. And, uh, you know, the lesson really isn't about me. It's about them, but I will show them, look, this is what you can do if you practice hard enough and you work hard at it. You can do these cool things, too. Um, but I don't spend the whole lesson doing it. I want them to, you know, get it and then they feel good, especially the younger kids. You know, it's really great for your self-esteem when you're growing up like that, you know, to, to feel like you've got a friend. Like I really felt like the guitar is my friend. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would literally lock myself in my room for hours just trying to get, you know, uh, a pull-off lick perfect. You know, while my friends were outside playing cowboys and Indians, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the room, you know, there was no Barbies for me. So no. it was, like, yeah, it was my, my Les Paul, lucky enough for me. <laughs> and, of course, during the during that, that period of the mid-'80s, it was a very male, masculine uh, scene in L.A. In, in terms of bands. I mean, you know, the, band, the kind of bands that were out there at the time, it was very... Uh, sure. yeah. in, in today's society, a lot of it would be very unacceptable behavior yes. in terms of <laughs> women's equality and so on and so forth. Yes. Um, uh, how, how did you find that? I've been, I've been 16 years. I mean, it's a very young age to be on that scene at that time. How did you cope with, with all that sort of positive and negative attention? You know, I think I was a little naive, which maybe helped me a little bit. Um, prior to joining Precious Metal in high school, I had played with a lot of, you know, other bands, just neighborhood bands or bands I found on, on uh, ad, adverts, you know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they were all guys, of course. Yeah. And they were all they were all very nice to me and they, they respected me, I think, because of my playing. But I don't know. There was always some kind of weirdness. You know, I could, maybe maybe they liked me or something. And I didn't really I wasn't really in, interested in that. I was you know, I just wanted to play in a rock band. And when I saw the ad for Precious Metal, it was an all girl band. I thought, I, you know, I'm going to try that because it's a band of girls, you know, and. I thought, well, this is cool because I had only heard of the Runaways and, of course, the Go-Go's and the Bangles, but they were doing more pop music. Yeah. The Runaways was the only band I heard that was doing, like, rock music. And, of course, I totally, you know, was inspired by Anne and Nancy Wilson from Heart. Um, so, and Janis Joplin and Grace Slick. And I knew that there were women out there that were doing rock and roll and they were doing it just as good as the guys, you know. So I knew it could, it, I knew it could happen. Uh, but I'm not going to lie to you and say it wasn't easy because, uh, I mean, that it was easy because there were times where it wasn't. And there were things like, you know, 
you guys didn't really play on the, your record. You know, other people played for you. And I mean, even one time at a gig, somebody said, oh, you guys aren't really playing on stage. Your boyfriends are playing behind the curtain. Yeah. And meanwhile, there was no curtain behind the stage. I mean, ridiculous things like I mean, that. That must be very hurtful for a young person to be listening to. You know, I just, yes, I, I. I didn't like to hear it, but honestly, you know, if you came to our shows and you, you know, obviously knew that we were playing our instruments, we were live, we were playing our instruments, we were playing them well, you know, at, at that time period, and we had good songs, we had a huge following in LA, and you know, we eventually got signed to a major record deal. So you can't deny any of that, you know, so I think no matter what people were saying at the time, it was like, oh, you know, well, whatever, you know, that's we're just going to ignore that because that's just ignorance, you know. So, of course, in 85, you released your first album with Precious Metal. Yes. On Polygram. Yeah. That must have been an incredible moment in your career as a, you know, as a bunch of young girls working the scene, working, you know, a very hard scene as well. Yes. Yeah. We, you know, we, we, we got lucky and, and well, lucky and, and, I mean, there was no such thing as luck. It's hard work meets opportunity, and we were ready for that opportunity. And um, it was it was great. Yeah, I mean, I I was 18 by the time we actually signed the deal, and I left college. You know, I was going to university, um, UCLA, which is a great college in in LA, mm-hmm. and I, I I left. You know, I left it, and I did talk to my parents about it, but they were very um, supportive. I think they knew that you know this was pretty much going to be my future, whether the band made it or not. You know. They knew that you know I was I was going to be a guitar player, and that's just how it was going to go. <laughs> it's, it's it's quite funny. Well, not funny as in humorously funny, but it's it, it it it's kind of obvious when you're looking at your background and when you're looking at your career, even up till even till now, there is that resounding, almost uh, obsessive work ethic. That, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> that that comes with that comes with you, Janet. Um, yeah. Well, the and, medication I'm taking now has really helped. So. <laughs> well, yeah, the vacation that isn't a vacation is. is, is no, is, um. Yeah. The prospective gigs in Portugal is that. Right? You know, yeah, I think that any musician who is really in in it for the long haul and is good at what they do and takes care about what they do and wants to be good and wants to continue to be good at it. We're all going to be a little obsessive. I mean, artists in general, general are obsessive because we're constantly trying to hone our craft. You know, nothing really is ever good enough, is it? So, well, I mean, you could, no, true, very, very. You true. might think it is, but you know, we we will. I you know I'll re-record a solo. You know, three hours. You know, until I get it the way I want it. I've I've seen that on many occasions, and, and with within my you know when I've interviewed people in the past, it's kind of a it's a common trait. To see with, with particularly with solo musician. Uh, yes, yeah. It's when you start doing your own music, you get even more crazy like that. And you know what? A perfect example, and maybe this is a segue to the next, the next part of the interview. But a perfect example of that is Lindsay Buckingham. <laughs> well, this is exactly what I was coming on to say because yeah. you, Janet Robin, the perfectionist, the the work, the, the you know the person with the great worth ethic, meets Lindsay Buckingham, the most famous person for being obsessive yes. about his work <laughs> and almost it's, the point where he has no social life this man yes and and, and all he does he, he he works and he goes home to his family and then works again yeah pretty much so how know, did that come to how did that happen you know and i knew and i knew him and was working with him when he didn't have his family he was or he had girlfriend or he was single so it was even worse mm. back then yeah. but you know, I, I think it's funny, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't believe really in, in fate. It just, it just, things just happen because they're supposed to happen. I guess maybe that is fate. I don't know. The yeah. point is, is that, you know, I attracted him into my life because we both are obsessive about things, you know, and I was supposed to work with him and I was supposed to meet him and he was supposed to take a liking to me because, well, he made me even more obsessive. <laughs> You know, he made me look at my work at, uh, from a different perspective than I had been before. Uh, he made me learn to be more of a professional. I was professional in, in precious metal, but not near the level that I had to be with him. Mm. And I learned just incredible things from him about being a solo artist. And I, I honestly didn't know that 
my career would go into that direction. I thought I would just be continue to be a guitar player in, in bands or, or a hired, you know, hired gun and, and with you know, major artists and things like that. But he actually inspired me to, to start my own project and he counseled me. I mean, he, you know, would listen to my demos and, and then he started giving me his demos and we, we tried writing a few times and it was, it was amazing. You know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, if you're Einstein's assistant or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anybody who's anybody who's worked with Lindsay Buckingham would always say that he is absolutely uh, the, 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 the word perfectionist. That's that's him in a nutshell. And he, he's very passionate and very yeah. um, gifted, obviously. Yes. You know, Fleetwood Mac is one of the, in my view, still one of the, the best bands that have ever been. Uh, right. Yeah, or, I agree. Or would ever be. Um, but with, 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 with Lindsay, he's... His obsession to detail and, yeah. and, and to production sound as well. Every, yeah, it's, it, it's is second insane. to none. It, yeah, it's it's insane. And then you know when when I toured with him, it was his first time ever bringing out a solo band, you know, a band to back up his solo work. Mm-hmm. He had released several solo albums, but he never toured on them. So he was even more obsessed about getting everything perfect so much to the extent that i we didn't know this but many of our rehearsals were being taped individually we were on the the microphones that we were singing through and practicing through and amps and stuff they were being fed to recorders on separate tracks so that after the rehearsals he would sit down and listen to everybody's work and when you found that out how did that make you feel i was i you know, I, I, well, I want to watch my language, but I, I almost pooped my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really, really made me nervous because I think, again, even though, let's see, I was about 23 when I got that gig, 23, 24. Um, you know, I was still learning to be even more of a perfectionist and more of a, a, a pro, a pro level player. And, and I'd never been on a major, major tour like that, you know, playing big places and stuff. Um, Precious Metal played a few things like that, but nothing. You know, we were we were more playing clubs, you know, um, and some of them were big clubs, but nothing nothing on the level of Lindsay. Um, yeah, it it freaked me out, Adam. I got to tell you, I mean, I I think it gave me a, a huge anxiety problem that has never gone away. And um, you know, and and in fact, he did sit down with me one day and he said, you know, um. You know, you're singing. You're, you you got to watch your singing on this part, and and you know your time on this guitar part is a little, you know, is not good. And and if you don't fix these things, I will have to fire you. Wow. And that's what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I literally, I mean, I, I got through the rest of the day, and then I just, I was in my car driving home crying. I mean, I know it sounds really pussy, but you know, I I just number one, I could not let. I did not want to let him down, but biggest thing was I did not want to let myself down. No. So, you know, yes, prior to that, I was a perfectionist, but boy, did I not know what was coming to me because that was a huge thing. And I, I literally took the salary I was getting and for probably about a month, I went every day to a vocal teacher to work on all of the individual singing parts that I had for, you know, for the show. And then I started going to a guitar teacher to work on my parts and then working a little bit more with a metronome. And I think, you know, I don't know if I was taking the gig for granted or not, but um, I just didn't know how to work at that level. And he, and he, he you know, he showed it to me, you know. Um, he told you to up your game and you did. You know, and, you know, he did. What I left out was he said, um, yeah, you know, if you don't get your, your you know, blank together, um, I'm going to have to fire you. But then he said, but I know you're going to rise to the occasion. Yeah, there you go. So I was like, oh, my God, I better get my shit. You know, I got, I got to watch my language, right? Is no, that true? not at all. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I got to get my shit together because I do not want to lose this gig. Absolutely you know, it, it wasn't about the money, honestly. It was it had nothing to do with that. It's you know? the opportunity, I guess, of working with... with- Everything. It was the pride and, and, you know, it was just like I can't let myself down, you know. I've got to figure out every way I can... I can to make this work. And, you know, in the end it did. And I think he had a lot of respect for me. And it, I wasn't the only one too, by the way. I mean, I know it sounds like I'm singling myself out, but he singled out other people in the band as well. Um, you know, he's a fanatic. So 
Absolutely. But, and then uh, working with another fanatic, obviously, which is, which is uh, Tina Turner. She was. Yeah. How, how, how was that experience? Um, well, you know, I didn't get to work with her. You know, we were on the we were on the tour with her, but it was a long six week tour. And I did watch her every night perform. And, and we were playing, you know, big places, arenas, you know, with 25, 30,000 people, which yeah. was also just a dream come true for me. But I, I did watch her. Uh, almost every night, unless we had to drive in on the bus uh, to the next city the next night. And I just watched her from the side of the stage. And she did the same exact show night after night, never missed a beat. You know, um, it was it was choreographed, brilliant. And, you know, it was a very entertaining show. OK, yeah, maybe there's no spontaneity or whatever, but that's not what that kind of show is about. I mean, it's just it's a hugely entertaining show that she put together. And she was, I think, in her 60s at that time. And, and she had these two dancers that looked about, you know, 20 years old and they could barely keep up with her, honestly. Uh, very yeah. fit lady, very, very physically and, and, and emotionally. Every Yeah, she's a strong woman. And I do remember um, me and the other girl in Lindsay's band, we both really wanted to, to meet her in person. I mean, we hadn't been introduced to her yet. And finally, her manager uh, set up the meeting and we went into her dressing room. Uh, I think it was after or maybe before her, one of her shows. And she she said, I I heard that there were women in in uh, Lindsay's band. I think it's fantastic that you two are playing in his band. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like a woman. You know, she's a woman supporter. Yeah, I, I get it. You know, she had a lot of problems herself, didn't she? Absolutely. I mean, very well documented problems. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, she was very supportive of that and thought it was really cool. And she just, you know, you can feel her energy even just standing in front of her. She just has this aura of, you know, amazing energy. So, yeah, that was just a really, you know, special time in my life. I didn't know if it would ever happen again or on that level or or what. And I just really was trying to be a sponge. I was trying to take everything in I could on um, and what can you, you know, what can you do? These, these times they come and go or they change, you know, of course, my career took a lot of different turns after Lindsay. Um, but that's how it is in this business. You know, one thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing. And you're supposed to learn from all of it and you're supposed to grow and keep getting better and better and better. You know? I mean, obviously, we'd met with, with, with that and then your experiences with the likes of Meredith Brooks, Michelle Shocks. Uh, yeah. Also, and obviously being a member of Air Supply. Yeah. Also, all perfectionists. And, you know, look, when you get to that level, people aren't fucking around. They're, they're, they're not fucking around. You know, there's a lot of money at stake and it has to be good. It has to be perfect. You so know? you have to so, bring your A game to work every yeah, single day. You, to, no, you know, you know it, it's it better be good. You know, so by the time I got to Meredith, you know, I was prepared for that gig. Um, but she, too, you know, she. She's demanding, and uh, I found her to be very open-minded, though, the fact that she hired another woman guitar player, mm -hmm. um, because she's quite a good guitar player herself, you know, and uh, she was very supportive of me and let me sell my CDs. Even she let me uh, open for her uh, acoustic uh, once on uh, a show that she had, her own show, and I opened for her. She was very um, supportive, and so I've been very lucky, I think, with the people I've gotten to work with. They all have been mentors to me in some way or another. You know. Do you think that kind of set the table for your solo career then? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I learn from every gig I play with, and especially when you when you work with these top level people, you you learn all ends of the business. You learn how to, you know, how to put a show together, on um, how to interact with the audience, uh, you know, even even the, the venues and how to talk to people at venues, the promoters and uh, the press, you know, such as yourself, you know, thing. Just just everything you learn, you know, how to dress and, and there's a lot of stuff, you know, that you that you learn. And I have put that all to work now, you know, over the last what I've been doing solo stuff now since 1999. Um, so, yeah, it's been been quite a long time. And, and, you know. and, and during that period from 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 99, you've been doing your own thing. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. I mean, you you put up some, you put your own music out on your own label as well. How did that? Yeah, my that? it's Little Sister Records, just because that's what my brothers, you know, called me growing up. I was, that's just my little sister, <laughs> you know. So yeah, I just made my own imprint. You know, I I got quite inspired by Ani DeFranco. Uh, I'm sure you know who she is, yeah. Um, and I did go see her several times in L.A. before she actually before she got really really big. And I just thought, wow, this is this is a woman in control. 
she was selling her CDs on the side of the stage. There was a huge line, you know, she's booking her own shows and she had a, a great show put together and she's just playing there on her own. And she was playing the shit out of the guitar and she was just awesome. And I was like, you know what, if she's driving around the, the United States in a car playing gigs, even in coffee houses or whatever, why can't I do that? You know? So that's what I started doing, you know, and, and this is really before the internet took off. It was very early stages of, of the internet and email and all that, you know? Well, absolutely. I mean, the internet came out, what was it? 93 or something like that. Yeah. I mean, there was email and there was things happening, but you know, the Google search, that wasn't, there was no Google back then. You know? Absolutely. Least, it was called a library back then, wasn't it? I don't know what it was called, but um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I had to do a lot of research to find gigs and, and book them myself and get in the car and go drive. And it was, it was very liberating. I have to say it was very liberating. And yeah, I was open to a record deal. I wanted to, to get signed and there was some interest here and there, but um, you know, the Lilith Fair came and went and that whole thing. And then there was a backlash of that, you know, female singer songwriters, blah, blah, blah. But then they would come see me and they 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 think my guitar playing was was really cool. But then they know they didn't know where to put me. You know, well, is she rock? Is she folk or what? You know, what the hell is she? You know, <laughs> so, you know, it just didn't come together as far as a, a, a major deal for me in the States. And I just figured oh, I'm going to put my own shit out like Ani DeFranco did. And I'll sell it at my shows. Why not? Which, I mean, why, why be pigeonholed? I think it's. Yeah, um, I can't be pigeonholed anyway. You know, my records, especially the one I did with John Carter Cash. It's all over the place, man. I've got, you know, it's a song about Prague that has this kind of, you know, Eastern European groove. And then I've got a blues song. And then there's a full on rock song with like an eight minute guitar solo. You know, but I don't care. I honestly don't care. You know, the age, the, the age of radio where it's like, you know, it's this style of radio or that style of radio. I mean, there's ra there's all kinds of things being played on the radio, especially on the Internet radio. And you know what? My style is just me. It's just me. It's under my name. And, you know, you can find all kinds of influences from me and they're all going to end up on my records. And that's how it's going to be. Do you think do you think that's part of the, I've, I've mentioned quite a number of times now in this conversation about your your work ethic and and part yeah. of your your writing style is to just and correct me if i'm wrong here is to sort of constantly keep your audience guessing at where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing next you know that's not anything purpose that i'm done do on purpose no i i just write whatever i feel you know or whatever inspires me uh and sometimes you know because i grew up listening to a lot of different kinds of music um and i and i've played all kinds of different music with with all kinds of different artists, you know? So I might be just feeling it that, that day that, wow, you know, I, I just heard a, a, some kind of awesome blues song on the radio or something. And I might go home and be like, man, I want to do some cool blues tune or who knows, you know? So you're very so, much a, you're very much a product of your environment and a person of yes, your environment. For sure. and yeah. Obviously and ever since I started touring, of course, you know, because once you get out on the road, there's so many crazy experiences and there's so many people you meet and there's amazing cities and towns you go to. And of course, ever since I've started coming to Europe and the UK, it's, it's gotten even more for that, you know, with me. And there's there's a lot of, play, you know, things I can pull from as far as what I want to write about. And, you know, and, and, and just your personal life, too. I mix in a little bit of that. And, uh, and you know, getting, getting older. I'm 47 now. You know, I'm not 23 anymore. Mm -hmm. So... There's, uh, you know, my parents are getting older and, and you know, they're not going to be around too much longer and things things like that. You know, what's what's important to me? What do I want to think about writing about? You know, and I don't like somebody telling me what I have to write or you have to be like this style or that style. I really don't like it. And what can I say? Maybe that's why I'm not really that famous, you know, but, you know, I'm doing what I want to do. <laughs> and if that makes you happy and makes the audience happy, which it does. I think it's, to me, that's being a true artist. So yeah. take it or leave it. You know, I'm not dissing the other bands that are famous or anything like that. And I certainly do not want to sound resentful because I'm not. It's just for me. I want to be true to myself. I always have been with everything in my life, in my personal life, in, in, in my relationships, in my clothes I wear. I've always been unique and just done my own thing. And so it's, of course, going to spill over into my music and into my career. And 
like it is a music business and when when you have a business there are a lot of rules sometimes you must follow and so you know i can't i just unfortunately can't follow all those rules no <laughs> you know to, to, to make the to perhaps make the big bucks but you know it wasn't always about money anyway for me i mean if it was about money for me i would have quit a long time ago i think it's uh, it's about uh you know it, it's a release for me to to perform I love performing. I love writing. It's it's a release. You know, it's a, it's a mental and emotional and physical release for me to to do this work. And um, you know, if I can get the respect, I I do I would appreciate that. And that's all I ask for. And, and you know, I'm paying my bills, I'm paying my rent, and I got food on the table and I yes, I don't have children, you know. I sacrifice some things, but it's I'm ha- I'm I'm happy with those decisions. Happiness is no sacrifice. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there Mommy, you go. I scared myself with my own profound statement. Then that was you quite... summed it up, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite frightening, really, wasn't it? Um, you're now obviously you're now in the UK uh, yeah. on tour, and you're going to be here for what? Let's have a look here. You're going to be here for shows. five shows. Four, four shows in the in the middle of the UK. I'm, I you know kind of avoid London until I can get really a proper show in London. I'm I'm avoiding London. I I'm just playing where where I built up my fans, which is in this Northamptonshire area. And I've got a good friend out here, Stevie Jones, who's also an artist as well. But he helps book the shows and promotes them for me. And I have a um, a promoter out here, a uh, press guy that uh, does some press for me and gets some radio stuff and this and that. And, you know, I don't know, Kevin probably told you that I played his prison last year. <laughs> did he That's tell you? right. Yes. How did that go? Amazing. I mean, that, it was really quite an amazing experience, I have to say. You know, I, I'm a, I'm this, you know, this chick from L.A. and I'm, I'm in this, like, room playing guitar and doing, like, a workshop, you know, with about, I think it was about 20, you know, lifers that I really didn't want to know what they did, but they were all, I think, yeah, they were all pretty bad criminals. Let's put it that way. You know, you've you've come, this is a, um, you're the second person to do this now. I know Zach Wilde did it. Yeah, a couple couple of years back. I mean, you, 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 uh, this, if I was ever to be banged up, or put in prison, that's the prison I'd be wanting to go to because every now and again, they get a very special visitor. They, and, they do. <laughs> first they get yeah, Zach Wilde and then Janet Robin. I mean, what else do we want, you know? For- I, you know, it was really cool. They were so, so polite and so respectful to me. And, you know, I came out with, with like, I came out, started out kind of just joking and making some jokes just to, to, to ease the tension a little, you know, because – I'm like I said, I'm just this chick from LA and these guys are like these burly guys, you know, with tattoos who's killed how however many people, I don't know. But you know, and they're staring at me, you know, and I'm like, okay, I just gotta ease the the moment here a little bit. And they really, really got easy and comfortable with me and they had great quest questions. They were of course very interested in Randy Rhodes. I showed them some techniques and then we had a jam session, you know, with, with the prison band. Mm. well that 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 i mean that prison is is very no very well known for being very like a very uh, nurturing and productive and i think a lot of credit has to go to kevin for that because he's obviously he's a huge music fan um this is kevin oaks by the way yeah yes uh, just for people that are listening um and He's a huge music fan, and I think he, he needs to take some credit for that and and, and, and for being inspiring enough to, to, to inspire others, even though they've taken, you know, certain paths that others wouldn't take in life. I think I think it's great. You know, I, I, I really think and this is this is going to sound a little, you know, new agey and philosophical, but I really think we're all on this earth to teach each other in some way. You know, we're all teachers in some way and you, you, you give back, you take, you give back, you learn this and that. It's a, it's, it's a constant exchange. And I, I just found out actually today that um, one of the prisoners is about to he's in an open prison and I think he's they're going to, to let him out on a parole. And he he's really got his shit together. Apparently, you know, he's he's 
going in business with his brother and they're going to open a rehearsal room for musicians. And he's quite a good guitar player because I played with him that day. Mm -hmm. And I sure hope he stays on the straight and narrow, you know. Well, that's but, great. All power to his elbow, you know. That's, um, that's yeah. I wish him luck with with all that. You that, know? that, that that's what you call a good news story, and it's it, it, it's great to to be able to touch somebody's life like that, and and for them to feel inspired, like you know, you felt inspired. It's kind of, I know it's a bit, well, without sounding cheesy, it's kind of paying it forward, isn't it, really? It, that's what I was trying to say, and and to me, music is so powerful. You know, it's it's my religion, and it, it's it is a powerful religion. And now you're taking that message across europe over the next few weeks I'm going to czech happy. republic is that right I, yeah czech republic i'm i actually do quite well there it's a small i'm kind of the big fish in the small pond over there you know so um i love i love prague it's one of my favorite cities and uh going going there in 2007 was the beginning of my my entry into the european market so that really all started started it for me and uh i i met a band through a mutual pro a producer in LA and they were from Czech and I asked to open for them. I really liked their music and they liked mine and, and they, their agent booked some festivals and shows for me and it, it just hasn't stopped since. And, and what now? What are we, I mean, after, after all this touring and, and, and now it's work. the whole world, Adam. No, was <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> tomorrow, today, Czech Republic, tomorrow, the world. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I, you know, my, um, my plans are kind of open, you know, maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. I don't know. I'm, I'm always searching for new places to go play. Like I would love, love, love to go play in Japan. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, that's, that's been a dream of mine playing Japan or Hong Kong, some, you know, some Asia, some Asian ar areas, maybe, uh, you know, South Korea or something like that would be really cool. Um, I'd like, love to experiment in, in more territories in Europe. Um, there are places I haven't been to Bulgaria and, you know, Birmingham. Uh, just a lot of places in, you know, Spain, Portugal, Birmingham, of course. Yeah. Birmingham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There are a lot of places that I would love to go play. I, you know, I need to make another record on, um, I've been touring on, uh, the the record I did with John Carter cash. And then this last new one I put out last year, which was the, uh, live in France record with my band from France. And I just really need, I, I need a new studio record and, so that's why, yeah, I may take off next year. I'm thinking about it, which that's really hard for me to, to say because I feel like, oh, my God, if I stop the momentum, will they still have me back the following year? But I have to just kind of believe in that. And good night. Good night. Good night. Um, sorry, I had to say good night to my host. That's okay. um, and I, I just have to believe that, you know, if I give myself the time to make a really good record that, you know, I can get the gigs again the following year and I don't have to obsess about having to go every year. <laughs> I am sure and 110% uh, positive that you take a year off to record yeah. a new album, which is what we want. We want, we want, well, we you know, want when more. you think about it, it's what all the major artists do anyway. So I don't know what I'm so worried about, but shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't be. That's your work ethic speaking again. And it is. Uh, yeah. I think we should also say, implore you to take a break in Portugal <laughs> as well and enjoy the sunshine. Yes, yes. The and I, you know, back, enjoy it. Good night. Good night. Um, yeah, I do enjoy actually the time when I'm at home. Um, you know, teaching the students, and then I've I've recently gotten into producing. I I set up a little Pro Tools studio in my apartment, and and I I recently just last year produced a full acoustic record for another artist, mm -hmm. and you know I get paid for that, and that's a, that's another part of my career too. I really enjoy being on the other side of the microphone, as they say. You and know? is there anything is there anything that you like to do other well, than music? Is there something? Do you have a hobby? Do you have? Oh, you mean besides music? Yeah. Because there are other things in music I still want to do. Like, for instance, I would love to to score a major film. Mm -hmm. That would be something I just love. Because, of to course, do. you have done a couple of scores already, haven't you? Yeah, I've done a, some short films, which is really a great experience for me. But I would love to, to score a big film. But, yeah, apart from music, you know, I have to say that um, I really love cooking. <laughs> it's so, I, I am, I'm a fan of cooking. <laughs> I, I, it, I love cooking. It's very um, therapeutic for me. It has absolutely nothing to do with music, but it's still creative. And, you know, like when you go record a song in the studio, you get to hear it back. Well, at least when you go cook something, you get to eat it. <laughs> exactly. So you get to sample it even. Right. Yeah. Even more intensely, you know. <laughs> um, 
So well, I love good. cooking. I like the outdoors. You know, I, I, I like hiking and various things like that. I love animals. And so, yeah, I, I try to do things that take me away from, from music because it is important to step away from it sometimes so you can get good perspective on things. But I must say, it has been an, an utter, utter pleasure to meet you, oh. uh, if, albeit via Skype. Uh, and one day our paths will cross, I am sure. My pleasure. Thank you for t- you know taking the time and, and the interest in interviewing me. Not, like I said, there's a, there's a handful of people that might know my name, but... You know, I appreciate the exposure and the support. I really do. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. It is all about the music, and it's important to to, to, to stipulate that it's what Global Onslaught is all about, uh, is, is speaking to the artist and well, getting to know them and following their story. With I'm happy to add uh, your link to my website, and uh, when this comes out, I don't know in what form, however it is going to be, just send me the information, and I'll get it out to all my fans. I certainly will. Thank you very much for your time. You're so welcome, Adam. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too.